Well, the National Strategic Computing Initiative, which was signed by then President Obama in 2015, was a very important departure from standard practices of the government and made clear the criticality of high performance computing to all aspects of US life. Uh, there's no question that uh, it was being driven by a need to satisfy mission critical requirements for several agencies. Uh, there was also, no question about it, a, um, a political aspect uh, driving the competitiveness of the US in terms of national, uh, national performance uh, delivery vis-a-vis uh, -vis others in the international community. Uh, there was a strong desire to make different agencies collaborate, cooperate together, uh, sharing uh, common needs and practices and developments. Uh, all of these factors were of a pragmatic importance. And the U.S., uh, according to the initiative, wanted to remain a uh, leader uh, in the field. Now, in truth, by several metrics, the U.S. is not leader of the field, although it, it uh, certainly is one of the highest um, uh, usage of high-performance computing in the world towards uh, uh, d defense, industry, commercial, and academic uh, practices. Other aspects of the NSCI, which are explicit in the statement, were to bring a better balance uh, among uh, the federal government agencies that use this with industry that supported and our suppliers, but in addition with academia, uh, in, uh, particularly in applied research on the application side and on the system side. This is made explicit and it's very important. I would say overall NSCI was intended to catalyze almost a renaissance in supercomputing in the United States, which had slowly waned over previous years due to practical, practical reasons. If there is a race between the US and China in terms of achieving exascale, in all likelihood China has already won. Uh, they have certainly won the mind share. It is expected that China will deliver a uh, exascale capable machine where exascale in this case is defined as uh, the uh, HPL or LIMPAC benchmark by 2020, uh, maybe 2021, sometimes they threaten the end of 2019. If the purpose is to do that, then I would give the odds uh, to China. I think more subtly, but even more importantly, is not that the U.S. wins such a race. It's important that no nation be perceived as building a stunt machine for the sheer purpose of this kind of superficial stature. And the Chinese are not doing that. They're not, uh, they're not building a stunt machine uh, now. But that the U.S. not be seen so far behind is not to even be in the leading edge of high performance computing. And in that respect, the U.S. must, must make a demonstrable uh, effort, uh, capability uh, to uh, assert uh, a, a long-term sustainable environment uh, for uh, students, for industry and manufacturers, and in support of the needs of, uh, of defense. Well, I'm old enough to remember these, these milestones, every, every thousand uh, capability. Uh, I remember worrying about gigaflops. I remember worrying about teraflops. I can remember, wrote a book about achieving petaflops. But now we're all going after exascale, not exaflops. So what in fact does that mean? There are several different definitions. It could be exaflops are max for uh, the, uh, again, the, the uh, LIMPAC benchmark. And I have no doubt that that will, that will play a role. That will be part of a, an achievement. But uh, others, uh, for example, in the exascale computing project funded by the United States, uh, defines it as a thousand times whatever we were able to do at a petaflops. So uh, this allows you to wrap in many of the inefficiencies uh, and um, uh, uh, other aspects of behavior. Does exascale mean exaflops? Certainly for some applications. An interesting question is what does it mean for memory? 
and the memory parameter, the memory dimension, had been largely excluded. If you were to look at today's fastest machine, uh, the Chinese Taihu Light at 125 peak petaflops, they have only about 1.3 petabytes memory. This is uh, almost a, a 100 to 1, where when I was young, we expected about one byte of memory for every flops of performance. This is a giant change, and it certainly doesn't seem to be suggesting moving forward in exascale. What does exascale mean? Whatever you need it to mean at the moment. Oh, well, that's a simple question. Where is HPC in the next couple of years? Slightly different from where it is now. End of story, but I suspect you want more. Uh, in truth, uh, frankly, even a machine five years out or seven years out is largely defined at the moment. The time to implement the NRE and, and the money uh, in order to go through the whole design process, the validation process, and ultimately deployment is usually five to seven years. And so we can't really talk about important changes uh, when we only look at the next, uh, the next two years. The European Union uh, has done very important work in high performance computing over the last two to three decades, uh, but principally in software, where at one time uh, the UK uh, and others did some of the innovative hardware work. The European Union uh, tended not to, for whatever reason, do that. An exception might be Barcelona, uh, the BSC, which has attempted to do architecture work. It's been acknowledged by many members across Europe uh, that there's a, an unfairness here. I, I think uh, they spend about 30% uh, of the total budget that's dedicated annually to high performance computing. But in terms of hardware, only receive about 3% of that. And that's a, that's a true imbalance, and they're, they're right to acknowledge that. I think what's uh, exciting about the new thrust in EU is that they open the number of different institutions that are separately pursuing very hard questions and will allow a diversity and richness of choice that in the past had been a little bit too narrow overall internationally and otherwise. The most important areas to which HPC is applying is a constantly changing factor. Some of it is just hype. Uh, others of it is the realization that at different scales, you can do new things. And so new fields that may not have been represented by large application work in HPC suddenly emerge. Currently, we're in a, a, a big trend on machine learning and uh, deep learning, uh, usually today referred to as AI. I won't go into detail about why I disagree with that in particular, but this form, we used to call them neural nets, this form of computing uh, at this scale is very important handling very large irregular data sets, finding patterns that, that in certain cases simply uh, was beyond human uh, capability, uh, if not comprehension. <clears throat> but there are other applications which continue to be very important, material science is extraordinarily important. New materials are always changing how we attack other engineering problems. Chemistry is still one of the widest consumers of, of cycles. Uh, the emergence of medical science, whether it's at the cellular biology level that ta handles uh, uh, viruses and bacteria, uh, or is in precision medicine, which ha handles large data sets. Uh, of individual people to find those trends in medicine that are so complex that they defy uh, ab initio simulation. Uh, this is an incredibly important, will continue to be an incredibly important path that will improve the quality of life uh, overall. There are other factors such as uh, in the defense systems, and I, I won't go into national security, but uh, they are greatly enhancing the ability to provide strength and projection of force with a minimum loss of life. And the idea of civilized war is a, 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 a counterintuitive, but nonetheless, we have a moral obligation uh, in the 21st century or the third millennium uh, to use tools like uh, computing in, in helping that. But I don't think that's where the most important application is going to be. Now, 
This is simply a prediction on my part. Many would disagree. I believe intelligent machines, machines that embody principles of intelligence, we don't have these yet, uh, that will ultimately go back to earlier schools of symbolic computing, rather the current uh, statistical or probabilistic computing or the training session-based computing, uh, will ultimately consume the vast majority of cycles in computing, whether it's uh, small supercomputers or supercomputers larger than uh, uh, can be imagined. Zeta flops, uh, I won't uh, avoid the word yada flops. Uh, so I believe that computing, intelligent computing, will dominate computing uh, within our lifetime. Von Neumann bottleneck was a consequence of disparate technologies for memory on the one hand and logic or processing on the other. And it separated these two uh, large components of a system because they were in two different physical media. Uh, initially, or almost initially, vacuum tube technology in the uh, late 1940s and through most of the 1950s. And after some uh, uh, failed approaches to memory, ultimately the core memory, a little tiny round uh, uh, ferromagnetic cores uh, with a few wires in it. And this uh, technology lasted for about uh, uh, two dozen uh, years, the von Neumann bottleneck was this separation uh, uh, that um, uh, was forced because of the technology, uh, the technology relationship. There were actually three questions in that one question, so I will answer all three of them uh, one at a time. Uh, today, uh, technology is semiconductor technology, although there are different fabrication processes to a first approximation, it's the same technology. You can conceivably build memory and logic on the same component, the same die. And indeed, if we talk about uh, cache memory, uh, that is on the same uh, die. So the, the, the need for the von Neumann bottleneck is one of heritage and legacy where the DRAM chips, or the dynamic random access memory chips, are still separate uh, from the uh, physical uh, processing uh, logic. So this is a consequence of tradition rather than out of necessity. But when large business models are based on this tradition, it is very hard to change. So your next question was, how are we correcting that? And we are not in completeness. What we have been doing, and I mean industry uh, throughout the world, is uh, making it possible to have a lot of bandwidth. We're not removing it. We're removing one of the two consequences. The consequence of the amount of information we can make to move in a, in a unit time. Very clever work has been done in recent years by uh, most of the vendors, often working together uh, to provide industry standards. But the other side of this is latency. It's the amount of time it takes for information to get from the memory side to the logic side. Now, to some that might sound like a, uh, a distinction without a difference. But in fact, it's a two space of optimality. And the way we address that, and have been for three decades, is by having very fast memory uh, called caches nearby the processor and hoping that when the processor wants a piece of information, it's already come from the memory and gone into this fast memory, the, the cache. Well, it still has to get there. <laughs> and there are another other, a number of other factors. So the third uh, question is how we should be going at it. And uh, there are several ways to merge the two uh, together. Uh, in my, my presentation, I describe one class of uh, physical architectures that uh, eliminate part of this problem. Uh, my colleague, uh, Peter Kogi at the University of Notre Dame, and another colleague, Ken Yopst, at the Institute for Defense Analysis, developed something we call PIM, P-I-M, processor in memory, where attempts to put logic into the memory chip were, um, uh, were used to uh, greatly reduce that latency as well. It still hasn't become commercially viable, um, but there is active exploration uh, in this. Uh, ultimately, I anticipate that uh, 
that the bon von Neumann bottleneck will be eliminated uh, because there is both the need and the technology to do it. So is there, is there an opportunity for return on investment of making this change? There is an energy barrier to this. Uh, it is industry standards. It is that architectures are designed in the assumption that there will be an external DRAM layer. DRAM chips are designed and implemented with the assumption that there will be a contact and communication with multiple microprocessor, multi-core chips. So there is, there, it is hard to make this transition and in the very near future, it's uh, unlikely, unless the question is energy, it's unlikely to find an immediate return in, in, in investment. In the long term, there's no question, but it's hard to get past this point. I mentioned energy. Energy is becoming the premier barrier to advancing supercomputing. And most of the energy consumed is in the data movement. And most of that data movement is between the memory and the processor. So if you follow that reasoning, the single best thing you can do to make these machines cheaper and therefore become larger is to remove that middle space uh, and, uh, between the processor and the memory and manage to put them together. And, and uh, other approaches are the idea of at least stacking processor and memory chips on top of each other so that the distance between them is tiny, which means reduced capacitance and reduced inductance, which means reduced energy uh, lost as well. Uh, so this is a deep question. It's a question that is driven in part by culture, by uh, a sense of politics, uh, by um, uh, where people feel their greatest value is. And this is different from country to country. Frankly, in any one country, it changes and is rapidly changing uh, right now in many countries. Uh, so what I think may not be either right or the thing that others do. However, I'd like to answer your question by saying what will not happen. If uh, the government, that always sounds like a separate entity. Uh, something sometimes our friend, sometimes our enemy, but never our next door neighbor. Um, let's change that. Let's talk about society. That means the corpus of people in our respective civilized uh, uh, societies uh, together and asking what is it in the common good that that society can do to motivate, inspire, catalyze uh, new industry, new possibilities to improving quality of life. Now, when you ask that question, the way I would answer it is, let's look at what would happen if that society as a collective does not invest in innovation, in technology and science, engineering, and frankly, other social matters like medicine and so on. What will happen is only the things that are easy to do will be done because those who invest on it care return on investment in the next quarter in the next year. That's how uh, uh, finances are reported. That's how investors judge their portfolios. And that means that everything has to be incremental. There's not enough time uh, and enough money to make uh, big innovations. Except when there is enough money and there's only one place where that money is and that is the, in the hands of a very small uh, a group of billionaires. I don't know, care what your currency is, they're billionaires. And it is they making the choices, not you, not society. It is they who decide, oh, I think it would be fun to build a reusable rocket ship. Well, I actually think that's pretty fun too. But I can't make that decision. But uh, any number of billionaires are investing because they can. Do you want the future of your society to be entirely determined by the limited number of opportunities incremental provides or what a few, even well-intentioned, multi-billionaires think would be fun, what their next toys are. I think not. I think each has its place, but I think there needs to be a third paradigm to advancing human uh, civilization through technology. And I, uh, my suspicion is that should be some model of government-managed, societal-invested 
contributions to new ideas. And by the way, when I say new ideas, I expect seven out of 10 of them will fail. Otherwise, they're not innovative enough. 